So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Horological Society of New York. My name is Ed Heidman, and I am the president of the society. And uh, tonight is a special occasion for me because it's my last meeting as president. Uh, we had an election last month, and um, so um, I am very pleased to announce that uh, Nick Manousis is going to be my successor, and um, want to assure you all that you are in very, very good hands. And um, I'd like Nick to come up for a minute. I have something that I want to give him as a token of my appreciation for all of his hard work for the society. So this is for you. Thank you, Ed. Yep. And uh, anyway, so with that, I'll leave it to Nick. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I open it now? No. I open it. So Ed's saying I should open this gift right now, so bear with me for one second. I'll open it. It should open quickly. <laughs> Ah, very nice. Secrets of Vashron Constantine. Very nice gift. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ed. Well, usually, uh, usually I say the introduction. I say, uh, hello, my name is uh, Nicholas Manousas. I'm the vice president. Uh, and I still technically am the vice president until January 1st, and then I'll uh, be changing that announcement. But it, it really is... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here every month with, uh, with everyone here in, in this room talking about watches and clocks and time. Uh, it's, uh, I remember the, uh, the first meeting that, that I attended a, a few years back on the Upper West Side, and uh, the room was considerably smaller, and the uh, number of people in attendance was considerably less, and so we've, we've grown. Uh, and that's, uh, that's exciting. It's, it, it makes me very excited uh, for the future of, of the society. Uh, and as, as Ed was mentioning, we had uh, we had this uh, election at our, our board meeting a couple weeks weeks ago, uh, and I, I said this at, at the board meeting, and I'll, I'll say it again tonight. The one thing that I'm very much looking forward to is the uh, the positive contribution that we can make to our industry, to our field of study together. It's a contribution that I think that uh, we can't. None of us can make individually, but, uh, but together with the direction that the society is taking, I'm, I'm, it, I'm really looking forward to the future. And so thank you all for uh, continuing to come out to support the society, and thank you uh, uh, to our, all of our sponsors who really make this possible. Um, and I know you probably don't want to hear from me tonight, so let's get on with the announcements and uh, get on with the main events. But again, thank you all for that. Thanks. So welcome. December 2016, our last meeting of the year. Uh, so I know there are a couple new members in, in the room. Are, uh, if, if this is your first meeting, maybe you could raise your hand and, and say hi. Yeah, how's it going? Thank you, thank you so much for coming out to the Horological Society. Uh, if you uh, would like to pick up your lapel pin, you can see me after the meeting, and uh, we've just replenished. We've got a big, uh, big bag of lapel pins here, and uh, we'll get one to you. Uh, thank you for joining. Really appreciate that. And speaking about membership, uh, we have a new reciprocal membership benefit. Uh, this is with HSNY and the AWCI. The AWCI is the American Watchmaker Clockmaker Institute, uh, of which uh, HSNY was the first affiliate chapter. Uh, AWCI uh, is, uh, we're very good friends, let's, let's just put it that way. We work together very closely. And uh, we've, been, we've been talking about ways that we can help each other out, uh, uh, what if we could do some type of benefit for our members. And uh, we've just recently begun uh, video recording our lectures. So now uh, all of the video recorded lectures uh, that HSNY is doing uh, are going to be available to AWCI members as well. 
uh, which is which is very nice. And then the reciprocal side of that, if you are an HSNY member, you now have a uh, complimentary uh, digital subscription to the AWCI's magazine, the monthly magazine, uh, the Horological Times. So if you go on the website, you'll see the details of that, and you can see where to uh, uh, to get access to the Horological Times. It's it's a wonderful magazine. It's really uh, focused more on the technical side of things, which is, uh, you know, even if you're not a working watchmaker, uh, it's, it's still very, very interesting. Uh, so I, I highly recommend everybody check that out. And uh, again, thank you to our, our friends at the AWCI uh, for their continued support. And I've got to give a little bit of, a, of an advertisement. I, I hope you'll bear with me for this. It, it is December, it is the holiday season. And if you're looking for a last minute gift, We've just uh, uh, worked on this new system uh, on our website. Uh, so if you would like to give a, uh, a, a membership as a gift or a horological education class as a gift, you're now able to do so on the website. Before it was a little bit difficult because if you're gonna give it as a gift, you had to tell the recipient first and schedule a time with them. Uh, the new way it works, you can buy a uh, a uh, one-time uh, gift code, and uh, the recipient can put that gift code uh, in our system at any time and schedule a class at their, uh, a class at their leisure. So it's uh, it works out nicely. And if you're looking for something last minute, you have uh, someone in mind that uh, enjoys uh, watches and clocks and horology. This is a, a great gift, and it uh, goes and uh, helps support the society as well. So hsny.org/gifts. Tonight's lecture. Tonight's uh, tonight's a uh, tonight's a, a very special night, and uh, we'll, we'll get right to it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, Mr. Michael Friedman. He's got an, a very impressive resume. Uh, he's an accomplished uh, horological scholar, lecturer, and historian. Uh, he was the curator at the National Watch and Clock Museum. Uh, he was the uh, his, historian. He is the historian at Audemars Piguet, and uh, kind of a, a, another uh, uh, fun announcement, a new, uh, uh, new uh, line he's going to have to add to his resume. He's now a trustee of the Horological Society of New York. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Friedman. Thanks, Ed and Nicholas. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. Um, so tonight, you can see I'm the historian at Audemars Piguet, but tonight's talk is not about Audemars Piguet. I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the horological roots, into ancient timepieces to begin with, and then make some correlations to what's happening on the contemporary sphere as well. So while most objects and technologies that we engage with on a daily basis, they're all gonna be upgraded in a matter of a couple of years or even less. But expertly crafted mechanical watches, they're technically designed and constructed to last forever, at least in theory. Mechanical watches, watches are among this tiny category of objects of permanence that stand in absolute defiance to the planned obsolescence that surrounds all of contemporary culture. Pretty much everything in our lives is subject to an, an immediate upgrade except for the mechanical watches on our wrist. The special place that watches holds in the present day is directly connected to the fact that watches are interdisciplinary by nature. They encompass many, many different roots in various spheres of both the arts and the sciences. This discussion tonight is going to explore how watchmaking's intertwined relationship with art and technology has been central to its evolution during the past 500 years. We're going to examine some key moments throughout the last 500 years and even earlier, coming right up to the present day. And hopefully we're gonna shed some light as to why mechanical watches continue to galvanize collectors and enthusiasts worldwide, and really why we're arguably in a golden age of highly creative and innovative watchmaking today. It's a very special time in watchmaking. So horology is among the most comprehensive interdisciplinary fields in existence with huge sociocultural relevance that goes all the way back to the ancient world and carries right up here to the modern era and to the digital age. For centuries upon centuries, horology, technology, and artisanship have been very closely intertwined. The world's museums proudly display timepieces adorned with exuberant examples of gilding, marquetry, mosaic, engraving, enameling, and countless other traditional creative techniques. Objects of time measurement constitute some of the finest examples of human skill and ingenuity ever applied to functional objects. 
With this in mind, I wanted to step even deeper into the past and spend a few minutes examining the pre-mechanical timepieces from antiquity to further ground horology's intertwined roots with both technology and artisanship. In the ancient world, the sun, the moon, the observable stars and constellations, these were the essential guides of time measurement and calendar information for early civilizations. For most of the history of humanity, we have been stargazers, simply put. Through celestial observation of the visible cosmos, we develop stories and we develop myth, but we also learn to survive and to persevere by understanding these natural cycles and patterns and applying both meaning and understanding to them. Inevitably, the natural world served as the basis and source of inspiration for all the earliest timekeeping instruments. Sundials were used to net measure the passage of time. Astrolabes were used to help map the stars and navigate the sands. Water clocks, the immediate ancestor of the mechanical clock, were used to trigger bells and eventually more complex mechanisms. And pre-mechanical timekeeping instruments evolved throughout the entire world, many of which are tremendously sophisticated and others that are very simple in design but highly effective. One of the most prominent distinctions of pre-mechanical ancient timekeeping devices is to consider that they measure, measure the passage of time. They measure elapsed time as opposed to indicating a specific time on the watch or the clock dial. By using light, shadow, water, fire, incense, our timekeepers literally and figuratively were rooted in nature and natural time, yet they were always the platform of the decorative arts. Many of the ancient systems were used for significantly farther, uh, more time compared to the several hundred years that mechanical clocks and watches have existed. Sundials, for example, like the ones imaged here, have been heavily used for centuries. In fact, at least 3,500 to 4,000 years, there's been variations of the sundial. There's not many technologies that have enjoyed such a legacy. In fact, outside of the wheel, the most immediate object uh, that's recognizable from antiquity is the sundial. Here you can see two examples. The one on the left is, um, rather on, uh, yeah, on, on your left is from Karnak, and that was discovered in 1904. And the one on the right is on exhibition in, um, uh, currently in the Middle East, and that piece dates to 1400 BC. Now, moving from light to water, this water clock's from 1400 BC. It was also discovered in 1904 at Karnak, the same time that obelisk was. It's a simple concept, but really effective. It consists of two containers. You got one container up here, and then you'd have one below. The one below is engraved on the inside with concentric circles, and underneath here, you'd have a little hole with a stopper. You'd fill the water up to the top, and then you would release the stopper. The water would drip down, and it would fill up the uh, container underneath. So in a lot of ways, it was acting like a chronograph would today, right? It's measuring elapsed time. And these were used in all types of different contexts. They were used to time political speeches and debate. They were used for horsing, uh, for rather for racing events. And variations were used not just in Egypt, but also in Greece, Rome, and many other parts of the ancient world. Note the beautifully carved uh, and highly detailed hieroglyphics. Here we're depicting planetary gods, constellations, calendar data, temporal gods, and it transforms the simple water clock into an object of great beauty and, and great meaning and great significance. So in addition to being platforms of the decorative arts, horolog horological objects have also been the subjects of work of fine art throughout history. This will be a theme that we revisit on occasion throughout this evening. This illuminated manuscript dates to 13th century and it depicts a monastic water clock that activates a series of bells. I'm gonna come back to this theme later. It's called Hezekiah and the Water Clock. It's part of the collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and it's one of the oldest known depictions of a water clock from Western civilization. Here you can see, oop, here you can see the water clock depicted right over there and you can see the bells. Now, water clocks evolved not just in the West but also the East. Uh, this example over here, some of you might recognize if you've been to the National Watch and Clock Museum or if you've been, spent time in mainland China. This is a depiction of Su Sung's water clock from 1088. He was an astronomer, philosopher, watchmaker, and clockmaker. Of course, at this point, this is long before the advent of mechanical horology, so these were all water-driven devices which would be set aside near rivers to provide the motive force. But they were bell-striking mechanisms, and they also activated automaton figures. There's been a lot of study into Su Sung's masterpiece over the last decade and a half, and you'll see some great recreations in mainland China today. Now, the astrolabe means taker of stars. It was introduced in ancient Greece about 2,300 years ago. Development is attributed to the Greek astronomer and mathematician Hipparchus. 
It's important to mention yet again this, in this inextricable relationship between time measurement and astronomy. It's one of these key disciplinary threads to technology that's also a pillar of tonight's talk. Now the astrolabe is depicted here in this painting from 1560. This is by Paolo Veronese. It's called Allegory of Navigation with an Astrolabe. The astrolabe was indeed the spiritual ancestor for all navigational instruments as it led to the armillary sphere, which leads to the sextant and the octant, and then eventually the mechanical marine chronometers that followed, all the way to today's GPS systems. The key thread throughout the evolution is that in addition to being true scientific instruments, these were always highly decorated objects that have been greatly valued for both their function but also their artistic attributes. These objects, all the ones I just mentioned, sit in world-class museums throughout the world, and they sit beside great works of fine art and decorative arts. Like wristwatches today, they're firmly rooted in both technological and decorative domains. Now the process of combustion, of burning incense or wax, has provided a means of time measurement, in particular in the Far East. In several countries in Asia, the passage of time was experienced through the sense of smell as well as being heard. They first appeared in China in the sixth century and they spread throughout Asia. They're very common in homes as compared to the grand water clocks like we just saw earlier that would have been on public display. This dragon clock is a very cool principle. It's actually quite small in reality. It's about a foot, 12 to 18 inches long. And along the dragon's back here will be layered incense. And you can see these bells here, rather these little balls are suspended by these very thin little pieces of string. So as the incense burns, the person will smell the passage of time. And then as it cuts, as it burns through those threads, the balls will drop into the pan and create a little sound. So you're both smelling and you're hearing the passage of time. But again, it's not telling you what time it is, it's indicating the passage of time. This is a key difference between timepieces in antiquity and timepieces that followed during the mechanical era. And you'll see other versions of incense clocks, and these still exist today, and they're still sometimes recreated today. Uh, you might be at an antique show one day and see something like this, and the vendor might not know what it is. Be sure to buy it and give me a call, because... <laughs> I'm certainly looking for them for my own collection. Okay, now I wanted to offer you this brief overview of ancient timepieces to provide some context as to why mechanical watches and clocks of the Renaissance, Age of Discovery, and beyond, why they're celebrated as works of art, and why they also celebrated astronomy to such an extent. In addition to decorative arts and the central importance of astronomy, it's also vital to take a moment to talk about time and sound. Again, this is another theme I'm gonna keep coming back to. The word clock itself derives from the Latin term cloca. Cloca translates to bell. The earliest mechanical clocks that emerged in Europe had no dials and no hands. They were initially automated bell striking machines. That was their primary function. So again, they're the passage, they're the link between the timekeepers of antiquity and the timekeepers of today. Before they told you what time it was by visual, they announced what time it was through sound. So before the individual hours were announced, like on a repeater clock, it would be a bell announcing an important time like prayer or community gathering or anything along those lines. Lines. Now, this piece over here, this is this clock, I mean, there's just so much I can say about it. I can do a whole lecture on this one, but I'll go quickly. By the late 14th century, dials and hands started to be added to clocks, and um, they essentially became the center of community life. Uh, many examples also included astronomical and calendrical information that were also found in other devices of the era. Um, these clocks, some of which still remain, they really became the pride of cities as well as citizens as they were vital to the ebb and flow of city life. They really became the heartbeat of the community. The greatest examples like this famous clock in Prague, has anybody been to Prague to see this clock? It's fantastic, right? Um, this is, what you might not know is that this is actually the third oldest known astronomical clock and the oldest astronomical clock that's still running. It was initially completed in 1410. It was made by two individuals, a clockmaker named Nicolas de Cadan, but also an astronomer named Jean Sindel. So when I say that these objects were interdisciplinary, I'm not being romantic. I mean, in their very inception, you had clockmakers working with architects, working with many, many artisans in the decorative arts, and of course, working with the astronomer to accommodate all of the different data that this clock displays. So in addition to being technical and mechanical marvels, it's also awe-inspiring, as those of you who have seen it, and it's an incredible example of middle age decorative arts, architecture, and the sheer entertainment and spectacle of it all. 
Now, the challenge of adapting large-scale technology like we just saw to smaller formats is not only a challenge in the present day, right? Technology is always about miniaturization. It was also the case during the Renaissance. The earliest table clocks emerged during the very late 1400s and incorporated the same style crown verge escapement as their large-scale predecessors, as did the earliest watches, which emerged around 1500. To really achieve these small sizes, though, the coiled spring was needed as an alternative to power the mechanism as compared to the large, massive weights that provided the power for tower clocks and larger clocks for the home. Much like the grand tower clocks, these great Renaissance table clocks and watches also featured extensive mechanical complications and were subject to great decorative and artisanal techniques. This incredible example, which is on permanent exhibition at the Met, dates to 1568. It was made in Augsburg by Caspar B.M. And the gilded case and dials are extensively decorated with hunting themes, mythological, allegorical themes. Every observable part of the clock, and even those parts that aren't observable, if you were to disassemble it, everything is the canvas of the decorative arts. Additionally, the highly complicated clock also features extensive astronomical data, an alarm mechanism, a quarter hour, end hour striking, and even an astrolabe. However, it was terribly inaccurate. This is an important note for you guys to understand who, who are interested in contemporary watches. Complications predate accuracy. We're gonna get to this point in a little more detail later, but long before you had accurate mechanical watches and clocks, they had sophisticated complications as we're seeing already. And that's exactly why they always have one hand as well. If you've ever been curious why these old clocks and watches only have one hand, they weren't accurate enough for that second hand. Um, and we'll touch upon this in a moment as well. Now, to demonstrate to what extent the complications predate accuracy, let's take a closer look at this watch over here. This was crafted in Holland during the first decade of the 17th century, and it's hard not to view this object as something akin to like an iPhone or portable computer of today. The watch, of course, tells the time. In addition, it strikes the hours and quarter hours. It has an alarm mechanism, a moon phase display. It even has an integrated compass and sundial up here. Dutch horology was beyond exceptional during the 17th century. Before Switzerland, before England, watchmaking had a lot of firm roots in Holland. Every surface of this watch is engraved with incredible allegorical themes and elaborate scroll work, as you can see. Note the engraved borders, the pierced case for sound transmission, even the bridges of the watch movement are finely pierced, chased, and engraved. A watch of this caliber was likely made for a very wealthy traveling merchant, and that's suggested by the integrated sundial and compass for setting the watch. Some of these are really fantastic. They even have removable components, and inside there'll be little handwritten notes or engravings of inns and uh, where the courthouses were and other places of importance for the route that people would be taking. But again, you have to understand, these objects were incredibly rare and incredibly expensive at the, this period of time. Far more expensive than watches today comparably, and even more so than those of the 19th century. To own a watch of this caliber during the Renaissance, this was a very, very special piece. It was more common to have pocket sundials, pocket astrolabes, to own a fully functioning, complicated mechanical the watch was, was pretty rare and pretty exceptional. Now this fantastical celestial globe with integrated, integrated clock is also part of the Met exhibition. It's made of gilded silver and gilded brass and it's exquisitely engraved with 52 constellations, 52. It was made in Austria in 1579 for the famed Kunstkammer, which was their art room of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II. The entire sphere, the whole sphere rotates once a day, once every 24 hours. The sun is depicted along the path of the elliptic and the day of the year is also indicated. In addition, it's an absolute work of art as much as it is a work of technological prowess. The fact that the beloved Pegasus is supporting the globe only adds to the appeal of this masterpiece. And again, the lines between form and function are just entirely blurred with a piece like this, and they essentially become undistinguishable. If you were to ask 100 people, if, is this a work of art or is this a work of technology, it's gonna be very, very split. Most, most people will intuitively look at this and recognize that it's very much a work of both. And it's an important point to make now. These disciplines that we separate today, this distinction between the arts and sciences that we make today is pretty much a relatively contemporary concept, only a couple hundred years old. 
For the makers of instruments like this, they did not distinguish between these fields whatsoever. The person who was stargazing through the telescope or looking through the microscope was also interested in drawing and illustration. Uh, the person who was interested in music and song and dance also might have been doing um, small illustrations of biological study. We see this over and over and over again, even with the great watchmakers and clockmakers that we're all familiar with. When you read their bios, you find that they had much, much broader lives than we anticipate. It's not as if they were there behind their bench 24 hours a day exclusively doing that work. And uh, we'll get to one of those makers shortly. Now, let's... Did I, uh, here we go. So in addition to being interdisciplinary works of science, tech, and artisanship, watches and other horological objects have also been subjects of works of art, as we've seen. Here's a really wonderful work by Rembrandt painted in 1633. It's called Portrait of a Young Woman with a Fan. Now, what's funny about this painting is you don't see the fan anywhere, um, but you do see the watch located right over here. That was on purpose. She was showcasing her watch. She was definitely showing off this timepiece. And it's among the earliest known works depicting a woman with her watch. Uh, I included a photograph of the dial, a sundial right next to it. This is an ivory diptych sundial uh, to illustrate the type of sundial that she would have needed to set her watch on a daily basis. Um, there's a play that was written in 1620 by Alan Middleton called Women Beware Women. And within that play, there's a whole debate that the main character is having with her courtesans as to which clock is best to set their watches by, because none of their watches work. And it turns out that Bianca, the main character, says no clock is truer than the sun. It's a wonderful work because Middleton, the author, is poking fun at the aristocracy. He's making fun of these wealthy people owning these essentially useless objects, which is pretty entertaining. But it's also interesting because it points to a fact that uh, some people in our industry have misinterpreted, and this is the whole story of women and watches. Um, some histories that you read will suggest that owning watches was a male privilege, and this could not be farther from the truth. This might have been the case in certain countries and certain regions at times during the 19th and 20th century, but the reality is that the ownership of watches uh, was based on economics, not based on gender. A wealthy woman would have had far more access to an object like this than uh, the man who was working down at the docks. And I just touch upon that because I hold, do a whole separate lecture on the history of women's watches, and I like to bring some of those threads into a talk like this, because this painting really speaks both to the origin of watches, but also the origin of women in watches. Now this watch photographed here is very similar to the one depicted in the painting. It's made of gilded brass, it has a blued steel hand, and it's a clock watch. It was make, made by Michael Newen in the early 17th century. It's called a clock watch because just like a clock, it automatically strikes the bell as the hand reaches the hour. The brass case has once again been extensively pierced and engraved for both decorative and functional purposes, again for sound transmission. By opening up the case, the sound of that bell will amplify much further, increasing the functionality of the timepiece. Aesthetically, the pierced uh, case becomes a work of art unto itself, demonstrating this handcrafted metallurgical technique of the era, which of course influenced the generations to follow. Now, while collectors and enthusiasts of watches tend to associate the art of finely painted enamel and other enameling techniques with Geneva, the fact of the matter is that France was really the origin point for this high level of mastery. The, te the techniques were developed in the 17th century, primarily led by a painter named Jean Toutin and his sons. This example, again, is part of the Met collection, dates to the mid-17th century, and the movement is by a maker named Jacques Guyon. So both the movement and the enamel portraits are signed. The portraits of the virgin, child, and angel on one side, and that of Joseph being awakened by the angel, are based on famous paintings by Simon Vouet. These classical paintings and engravings were typically the source of inspiration for the fine enamel watches from this era. The process itself is as technical and temperamental as it is inherently artistic. This art's dying today. We have very few artisans capable of executing painted on enamel with such a high level of precision and accuracy. For those of you who follow auctions, you'll notice that regardless of the age of an enamel, whether it's from the early 1700s or whether it was one made for Patek or Audemars or Vacheron 30 years ago, any beautiful original hand-painted enamel is currently galvanizing bidders. People are recognizing there's fewer and fewer of these remaining in excellent condition. And museums are becoming one of the last places to be able to observe and see these pieces. So up to this point in history, as decorative in watches and clocks were, and as mechanically ambitious as they were in terms of complications, as I mentioned earlier, they were still not accurate whatsoever. 
Sundials had continued to evolve over the centuries, and as of 1600 to 1650, they were far more accurate than their mechanical siblings. The sundial was really the true scientific instrument, and the watch was very much the work of art still at this point in time. But this was all about to change. It was not until well into the mid-17th century that advancements in mechanical horology developed to the point where accuracy and reliability could truly be achieved. It's during this period that the discoveries in science and tech become increasingly reliant on accurate time measurement and the pioneering works of the interdisciplinary masters who created them. Among the most creative individuals that helped make this leap from timekeepers being incredible novelties to vital tools of scientific dis discovery was the Dutch astronomer, horologist, physicist, mathematician, and thinker Christian Huygens. Huygens invented the pendulum in 1657, which greatly increased the accuracy of clocks, and, was among, and he was also among the first to develop the balance spring, which greatly increased the accuracy of watches. Robert Hooke's also credited with uh, introducing the balance spring just ahead of Huygens. Huygens' invention of the pendulum and the development of the balance spring are still the primary means of mechanical horology to this day, well over 450 years later. These two inventions changed everything. These two inventions changed the worlds. While Huygens may have been the inventor of the pendulum, it was an English maker named Thomas Tompion, whose work is depicted here, who really advanced the field tremendously in so many respects. He produced many exceptional and inventive clocks, watches, sundials, as well as scientific instruments. Mechanical engineering, astronomical modeling, physics, metallurgy, experimentation, and the talents of endless artistic trades really are central to the development of watchmaking and clockmaking and its influence on broader scientific inquiry during the Age of Discovery. With the invention of the balance spring and pendulum, timekeepers evolved into vital instruments of scientific observation and experimentation as it pertained to astronomy, physics, navigation, and surveying. The establishment of the French Academy of Sciences by Louis XIV in 1666, that's what's depicted here, as well as the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England in 1676, speaks directly to the ever-increasing importance of horology as it pertained to the quest for scientific discovery. The watches and clocks themselves were often, rather the watch and clock makers themselves were often astronomers as well as makers of scientific instruments, as was the case with Huygens. By the early 1700s, watches and clocks were in many ways the computers of the era. They were platforms of technological prowess and tools to determine very specific and accurate calculations. Unlike computers, however, they continued to be uncompromising works of art. They were decorated by artisans using countless methods and techniques that developed with great diversity, and they were guided by the codes of the particular region in which they evolved. Even with the increase of accuracy and the integration of timekeepers into the advancement of scientific pursuits, the decorative arts still remain central to their existence. Watches and clocks were designed to last forever as they are today. This notion of planned obsolescence was still centuries away. So the fusion of mechanical ingenuity with artistic expression that's achieved during this era becomes the foundation for the entire watch industry for the centuries to follow right up to now. Here we have a quarter repeater. Note the bell mounted inside of the case. This was made by George Graham, who had worked for Thomas Tompion, whom I just mentioned a moment ago, and Graham went on to marry Tompion's daughter. It's pretty fun when you get into the life of these watchmakers, you realize how small of a world it is, much like today. In terms of technical advancement, when studying the late 1600s to the mid 1700s, the emphasis quickly becomes on the English makers, the clock makers, the astronomers, the watchmakers, guys like George Graham and Tompion, who I mentioned, but also Thomas Mudge, and of course, the carpenter who changed the world, John Harrison. They all accelerated the field of horology in exceptional ways. It's essential to mention that so many steps forward in the history of science and technology are directly linked to the ever-increasing accuracy of our time measurement objects. The more accurate device, the better we can calculate, navigate, observe, survey, pursue. Interestingly, objects of time measurement, even when created for very specific purposes, have always been designed and decorated with great effort and purpose. For those of you Rolex collectors out there, just think of your original Milgauss for a second. Why would this tool watch made for scientists at CERN be designed and made with such great technical and aesthetic care. The lightning bolt hand, purely, purely aesthetic. There's no reason for that. That's the insertion of the decorative arts into the form today. Now this, of course, is a prototype of Harrison's H1 chronometer, which led to the invention of the chronometer 
But look at this. Again, is this a clock? Is this a watch? Is this an object of virtue? Is this sculpture? What is this? For those of us who don't know about Harrison and the quest for longitude, we would have a very hard time categorizing e even what this object is. But we know it's an object of immense scientific importance, but also one of great beauty as well. Here's a beautiful masterpiece from Tompion from 1680. I like to select this watch because it still feels so contemporary in some ways. Um, it was designed for travel. Um, it strikes the hours, the quarter hours, has an alarm mechanism, once again, pierced and engraved to amplify the sound of the bell. And clearly this was designed to be shared. It was designed to be admired. It's not surprising that watches and other time measurement devices have been symbols of memento mori and depicted in many works of art, especially in Dutch old master paintings. Sometimes the symbolism is overt, as with this example, skull form watches have been objects of great intrigue and morbid curiosity since the 17th century. And again, we're seeing this aesthetic uh, resurface with many contemporary watchmakers. Now this was created in 1770 by the great clock and watchmaker Ferdinand Bertoud. It's an astronomical regulator and it really exemplifies this marriage of science and art within horology. It's referred to as an equation of time clock. In addition to being an incredibly accurate scientific instrument, it measures both true solar time, which is time told by the sun, and mean time, which is time as indicated by the mechanical clock or watch. Without getting too deep into the subject, there's slight variation between these two systems due to the elliptical orbit of the Earth on its tilted axis. This creates variance between solar time and mean time. Understanding this variance and calculating it, again, was essential for navigation and science and tech. So these clockmakers and watchmakers pursued it. So we see equation of time wristwatches today. I just wanted you guys to see that in 1770 we have a clock with it. And in the early 1800s, Breguet already nailed this complication on a pocket watch. Um, you really cannot do a talk in this field, and really anything related to watches, especially when we're talking the combination of decorative and technical, without, of course, bringing up Abraham Louis Breguet, just an absolute giant in this industry. Those of you know that Breguet, his inventions of the tourbillon, his advancements of so many different complications, but he was also so aesthetically driven. If you've ever wondered why in the auction catalogs you'll see something referred to as Breguet numerals, it, the Arabic numerals weren't enough for him. He restylized them. He redesigned them for his own aesthetics. We call them Breguet numbers because he popularized that slight italicized look on many of his watches. So he was an absolute um, major, major player in all aspects of the business and industry, and his influence is still felt today. Um, for those of you who aren't sure about the market of pocket watches, because we tend to hear, oh, wristwatches are really popular. Pocket watches don't sell so much. This one had a low estimate of 600,000 US and sold for 3.3 million just last year at auction. So many of the watches that achieve over $2 million at auction are in fact pocket watches, not wrist watches. It's pretty cool to keep your eye out on these types of objects when they come up and when they tour at museums and when they come to the auction houses, I encourage you to take a look. Even if you're truly, truly a wristwatch lover, it's really cool to see the evolution, especially for the complications that predate our wristwatches by uh, well over 200 years. Here we have a beautiful example that's attributed to the great automaton maker Jacques Edreau from 1790. Those of you know Jacques Edreau was a maker of automatons. You can visit some of his work at the Franklin Institute. Famously, his, his like the writer is one of his great automaton pieces down there. But he also did watches. This one, he had this beautiful enamel painting depicting the peony flower. Uh, it's a quarter repeater, and this was made for the Chinese market. The Chinese market was central to the Swiss and English watch industry in the late 1700s and early 1800s. The greatest watches made in Switzerland were often destined for Chinese royalty and elite during this time period. In addition to Jacques Edreau, other makers, including Daniel Isaac Piguet, Capt, and Melon, were also producing watches both for the European and for the uh, Asian market. Um, these three are central in terms of complicated musical watches, automaton watches, erotic watches, all cased in the finest enamel of the day. This piece was made by Piguet and Capt in 1810. It consists of a hand-colored, uh, hand-watercolored painted fan, a finely tuned musical movement, and a concealed watch. It's one of very few known examples and an absolute treasure of horological history. This piece was commissioned by Prince Ferdinand. Again, entirely blurring the lines between form and function in every respect. 
The Barking Dog's a real famous creation by, uh, also by Piguet Melon. Uh, Piguet's follow-up partnership after he left CAP was with a maker named Melon. And the Barking Dog is basically an automaton repeater with bellows that were engineered to make the dog sound like he's barking instead of a traditional bell sound or chiming sound. So when you activate, it actually sounds like a woof woof sound. And uh, the dog moves his tail, the goose flaps his wings. It's a whole incredible automaton scene. But there's a lot going on in a watch like this. When we think about a repeater, think about a minute repeater for a second. There's 12 hours on the dial, there's 60 minutes each hour, that's 720 permutations. That means a minute repeating watch has to be programmed for 720 unique melodies, right? The shortest being 101, the longest being 1259. It's an exceptional piece of mechanical computing. Likewise, the automaton also has very, very interesting uh, connections to contemporary robotics. If you trace the history of robotics back, you land at mechanical automatons, of which these are very uh, much a rudimentary, but very much part of that legacy and that story. Now, the Bonaparte family were immensely loyal to Abraham Louis Breguet, whose work we were looking at earlier. Many members of the, uh, of the Bonaparte family collected Breguet watches. The one I, photo the one I uh, have the image of here was ordered by Josephine in 1799, and she received it in 1800. It's 18 karat gold, blue enamel, diamond set hunter case. It's a petite subscription attack watch. When open, the time is displayed on a small circular traditional dial, as you can see over here. Uh, when, and uh, when it's closed, the time is indicated by this single diamond set hand and these 12 diamonds over here. So you can see the time whether the watch is opened or whether the watch is closed. And um, each circular diamond represents the hours I mentioned. And again, form, function, completely bl bl uh, blend together in a piece like this. This was another one of these multi-million dollar pieces to come up at auction recently, significantly going over its estimate, both for its beauty, its rarity, the fact that it's Breguet, but of course also having been the provenance of Josephine Bonaparte. Now the 19th century saw the baton pass from handcrafted masterpieces that we've been exploring to the beginning of mass production brought on by the Industrial Revolution. For those of you who've ever wondered why Swiss watches have such an elevated reputation, it's not, because, it's not only because of the rich tradition of watchmaking that had occurred there for centuries, it's also due to the fact that the Swiss, particularly in the Valley des Joux, where Audemars Piguet, Patek, Vacheron, Jaeger evolved from, um, they made the choice to not adopt the mass production machinery that the English and the Americans had adopted full-fledged. So the Swiss, in other words, during the height and during the peak of this Industrial Revolution, they said, you know what, we're going to adopt a couple of these machines to speed up the process, but we're mostly going to keep doing it by hand. That's why the Swiss have elevated over the last 150 years, where the rest of the world generally chose other directions. Of course, there's pockets of activity throughout the world, but this is really, it's, it's what the Swiss chose not to do as much as what they chose to do. Uh, now we're seeing traditional watchmaking techniques again emerging here in the US and England as well. Now, as the century progressed, watches with increasingly number of complications were created, this pursuit towards science. Keep in mind, these watches are scientific instruments. This is the means to do all of this activity we've been talking about. We're still a good 30 years before the advent of the quartz clock. That doesn't come until 1927. They don't start replacing electromechanical clocks till 1929. So when we're in the 19th century, mechanical timekeeping is life or death. It is science and industry. So that pursuit of complications does not stop. It really hits its peak towards the end of the century. And this is where I'm going to put my Audemars Piguet hat on for a minute and talk a little bit about the universal here. We're all aware of the Graves watch, the incredible ultra complicated watch that achieved $25 million, uh, made by, signed by Patek Philippe, made by some of the great, great watchmakers in the Valley des Joux. It has a very, very interesting origin though. The history of ultra complicated watches really begins back in this era in the 1880s. This piece we called Audemars Piguet made for uh, Durstein. We made it for a German company. Uh, in 1889, and it was also part of the 1889 Paris Exposition. Um, I like to talk about the exposition because it really gets to this intertwining roots of artistry and technology. Now, here we are in 1889, the Eiffel Tower is being inaugurated, the list of attendees include Gauguin, Vincent van Gogh, James Whistler, Edvard Munch, inventors Nicholas Tesla's there, Thomas Edison is there, 
And watchmakers were also in attendance. Audemars Piguet were among them. They were showcasing highly complicated men's pocket watches and also diminutive women's minute repeating pendant watches, which actually at the time cost more than the men's grand complicated watches because the miniaturization was so difficult. The most popular entertainment spectacle at the Paris Exposition was Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley's Wild West show. So us crazy Americans were brought out by boat to entertain all of the cultured Europeans during the 1889 Paris Exposition. The reason why I like to talk about this is we often think of objects of culture, art, invention, and science as being these separate entities, these silos, but in reality they're much, much larger. They're part of a much larger cultural dialogue that's taking place. That's why I've been showing you works of art during this evening's presentation and giving you some historic touch points. You have to look at how these things connect, and I don't have a slide on this, just in your mind quickly, just think about Art Deco uh, architecture for a minute and see the buildings, see the interiors in New York or Miami or Paris, and then think for a second about the jewelry and all the geometrics, the use of onyx. Think about the watches of the Art Deco period, the clothing, the music. You quickly see that it's not just about one object in a silo, but it's a much broader cultural dialogue that's taking place. That's something to really keep in mind when you're looking at contemporary watches today. You know, look at them in the context of today. Look at other parallel fields. I'll get back to that again in a brief moment. Now, in addition to great engineering and technical pursuits of the 19th century, we also see the continued experimentation of design language and form language throughout the 19th century. I selected this group of diverse watches that were made for women. I wanted to showcase this, again, to show that these explosions of creativity we're witnessing now had also occurred in history as well. You see everything range from a beautiful enamel butterfly with concealed watch to this lorgnette that folds out. This is actually a Patek Philippe lorgnette watch right here. Form watches like musical instruments, the harp, the fruit. We saw the flower early. These are sometimes referred to as fantasy watches by some individuals, and these also have a very interesting collecting pedigree, but more importantly, when you look at contemporary women's watches and how many of the brands are trying to capture the sense of whimsy, these are some of the sources of inspiration that they're going back and looking to. If you spend time with Jean-Marc Widerrecht uh, when he was working on The Poetic Wish, for example, these are the types of objects that he was thinking about and learning from and studying. Some of the greatest independent watchmakers today and the manufacturers do look to the past frequently for sources of inspiration. Now, the 19th century was not only a major time for the development, advancement, and decoration and proliferation of watches, it was also during this era that big steps were taken in terms of the concept of time itself. Up until 1847, the entire world kept time based on local time, time set by high noon, your own local high noon. The problem is that high noon is relative to where you're located. High noon in New York is not high noon in Chicago. Britain was the first to begin to solve this problem with the establishment of Greenwich Mean Time by the Railway Clearinghouse in 1860, and most public clocks in Britain were set. Britain's a little easier, right? Geographically, it's not spread out so wide, so they were able to accomplish this a little easier. It took the U.S. a lot longer to jump on board, not until 1883. Consequently, that's also the same time that Japan adopted the Western system of time measurement. So the 1880s, the world is getting smaller, right? This is all due to the Industrial Revolution. When we talk about the world getting smaller here in the digital age, this is really the third wave of this happening. The first wave of this happening was with the solving of longitude and the ability to navigate oceans in an easier way. The second wave of this happening was the Industrial Revolution, and now we've achieved this again, but more in the digital sphere. So here we are in phase two of the world really getting smaller and the need to establish time zones. We established time zones here in 1883 and it was really a matter of controlling the railroads. If you look back before the time zones were established, there were devastating railroad accidents because no one was able to coordinate their different local high noons. Trains were coming on the same track in the same direction because everyone was coordinating locally. So there was the need to systemize time as we know it. I mention that because it's something we take for granted and it's only a 125, 130 year old concept, but it's something we all take for granted today. 
This period created an absolute boon for the American watch production as the railroad system needed standardization and the quality and layout of the watches. We're all familiar with railroad watches. The combined popularity of the railroads and the, new for, the newfound affordability of watches brought by the American mass production created a vibrant market. You know, watches were now available for everybody for the first time. This was the first time in all of history that mechanical watches were available to the general public. In addition to cost cutting as a result of the mass produced movements with interchangeable parts, alternative materials like lower carat gold, gold plated, and even common metals like gun metal were used. And the marketing and sales of these mass produced watches had to appeal to an entirely new demographic of buyers, um, and which was also very new and exciting territory. So we literally, in a matter of 30 years, we went from like unique creations, things being made as one-offs, few pieces here and there, to watches being made in the tens of millions, in the tens of millions, absolute major, major shift to keep in mind. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about wristwatches. Up until 1800s, men mostly wore pocket watches and women wore pocket pendant, brooch, or novelty watches. Sometimes these included rings and sometimes they included bracelets. Women were always more innovative with how they wore their watches than us men. There were, of course, exceptions and experimentation with wristwatches, but they really weren't popular. Over here is one of the more famous early wristwatches, but it's really still technically a conversion of a pocket watch. This was a request from Louis Brandt, who went on to found Omega. He asked Audemars Piguet to make him a minute-repeating wristwatch, or a minute-repeating watch he could strap to his wrist. So this is actually quite small. It's a, it's a little 14-line watch, so it probably would have been a larger woman's pendant watch, and then the lugs were soldered on, the strap was put on, and it became now known as the first minute-repeating wristwatch. Interestingly, it's not at the Audemars Piguet Museum. You'll have to visit this at the Omega Museum to see this piece. Um, but we have a very good relationship with them and uh, we share plenty of information about shared objects like this. Now, it wasn't until the Boer Wars that men really started to strap watches on their wrists in large numbers, and it wasn't widespread practice until World War I. As images of the World War I soldiers started to appear, um, you know, the popularity soared, right? Imagine you're the younger brother or the child um, of, your, of, of these war heroes coming back, these, you know, these guys, look at them. I mean, they exuded so much. These guys were heroes. You wanted your big brother's strap, strap watch. You didn't want your, uh, your father or grandfather's old stuffy pocket watch. All of a sudden, the wristwatch was masculinized. It was popularized. It completely went from being a feminine object to an uber-masculine object, all as a result of World War I. And it's an important point to mention, now, Pocket watches have been in existence since about 1500. Wrist watches really since the 19 teens. So we're really only in the first 100 years of wrist watch production. We're still very much in this era of experimentation. Uh, this is something again to keep in mind. Now, advertisements from the 1920s compared to those from the 30s also provide a window into this transition of popularity from pocket watches to wrist watches. Over here, this ad from Audemars Piguet from 1924, it shows diminutive woman's pendant watch, uh, be three beautiful po complicated pocket watches, and a little minute repeating wristwatch here, one of the 35 minute repeating wristwatches we made back then. Now, you just jump 10 years, really, it's 13 years ahead in the timeline to this Rolex ad from 1937, and we see a complete different picture. All this variety of wristwatches and only one little modernized pocket watch uh, to show. Now this difference is also reflected in the actual exports and the actual production. It went from about 80% pocket, 20% wrist in 1920, and it flip-flopped by the 1930s. It made a complete, complete switch. So really the 1930s is when you start to really see the proliferation of wristwatches, and it was pretty slow because of the Great Depression. It really doesn't take off until the, uh, the pre-war and war boom. Now the success of wristwatches during the early to mid 20th century required experimentation and pursuit on both the creative and artistic front as well as the technical front. From the design viewpoint, the wristwatch created an entirely new platform of expression or canvas. 
We know from existing watches as well as from first generation documents, sketches, and photographs from archives like that found at AP but also elsewhere that watchmakers and case makers were demonstrating amazing creativity and deep thought with each creation. They really didn't know what to do yet. When you look at the early sketches and early design of wristwatches, it was really a platform for experimentation. And there were two t key things to keep in mind. One, they had to design these new styles, but they also had to consider miniaturization, right? A 9, 10, 11, 12 line movement for, for the watchmakers in the room, you guys all know that that's a lot harder to deal with than a 17, 18, 20 line pocket watch movement. So you also had to create the machinery and the standardization of these smaller movements, and that was particularly difficult with complicated watches. Now, during the 1910s to the 30s, the rectangular cushion and tonneau shaped watches were primarily in, f in favor, and I brought, showed you a variety of these different sort of what we would call Art Deco watches over here. You have a Cartier, a Patek Philippe, a couple APs, a Long Jeans, another Patek Minute Repeater, many different complications, many different styles. But even if we were to ask an expert of jewelry, somebody who really doesn't know watches, but knows jewelry or knows art or knows architecture, most of them would be able to place these watches smack into the 1920s. Why? Because the design language and the form language is so damn strong. This is an amazing thing about watches. They're windows into the time period in which they were made and their windows into the minds of the men and women who produce those pieces. As we shift into the 1940s to the 60s, circular starts to take favor over the other shapes. Not entirely, but it begins to take a little bit of, fa of favor. And again, we see a diversity of styles and complications and sizes. Two watches from Rolex over here, uh, the Patek 1518, which just achieved 11 million, one of the only uh, 21 AP full calendar chronos, beautiful early Rolex sub and a beautiful Vacheron chronograph. So again, all these watches are made within a 15 year period of each other, but the design of the cases, the finishing of the dials, the shapes, the aesthetics, the codes could not be more different. This is a beautiful aspect of 20th century wristwatches. This is why people collect wristwatches. This is also why you should only buy and collect what you love. There's enough out there to find something that you really, really appeals to you, and that's your identity. I, I refer to your watch as your second skin in many, many respects. It's our identity. We literally wear it on our sleeve. Now, during this era, the case makers, dial makers had such wide latitude. This, here's an ad of three different Audemars Piguet uh, complicated watches. And you can see that th what's interesting is each three has a different movement, number one, which is fascinating. Three different providers. These two were base calibers from Le Colt. This was a base caliber from Valjou. Each three has different case makers, and each three have different dial makers, all Audemars Piguet, but the work was sourced to different employees within the company and different independent contractors within the Valley des Joux, creating three very, very different stylish watches, all made from the same time period. Now, the diversity of rich watch design during the 20th century is nothing shy of inspiring as, as I've been touching upon. And when you pull the lens back, you can see that cultural dialogue taking place. I put up these three images over here of the Reverso, the Gilbert Alberts for Patek, and of course the Royal Oak, just again so you can take in that notion I was discussing about shared threads between horology and architecture, jewelry, fine art, sports, motor cars, all these different universes and worlds that are part of the cultural exchange, which contributes towards the development of watches. Now we're heading into some interesting territory here. The quartz watch was invented in 1969. This is 42 years after the quartz clock was invented at Bell Labs by Marison and Horton. So the industry had 42 years to prepare for what was coming, but nobody really prepared for what was coming. There was no doubt that the quartz technology was superior. Quartz clocks wiped out electromechanical and mechanical clocks from existence for the most part. There was a few exceptions in school systems and hospitals that kept some system in place. So why was it that the industry was so taken aback when the quartz watch finally took off in 1969? They had had it easy for too long. 
Now, in the Swiss watch industry, we refer to this as the crisis, the quartz crisis, because it devastated much of the industry. Well-established brands like Patek, Audemars, Rolex, IWC, Omega, and several others adopted this new quartz technology. For the Swiss, it was the Beta 21 caliber. Of course, it originated just pr prior a caliber made in Japan by Seiko and debuted on the Astron in December of 1969. The beta, the beta 21 debuts a couple months after that point, but many of the companies utilize the, pretty much the exact same caliber. We refer to that as the, uh, as the Quartz Beta 21, its successor was the Beta 22. They've become very, very collectible to collectors today. Now, to the rest of the world though, while this was a crisis for the Swiss watch industry, it was really a revolution for the rest of the world because once again, just like what happened in the Industrial Revolution, it just changed the watch landscape forever. Um, the quartz watches that evolved in the decade and a half since their introduction took two distinct turns, both turns towards massive popularity. On the one hand, you had the creation of really the first smart watches, these tech watches. This, of course, is the Hewlett Packard HP01. This was one of their first calculator watches with the LCD display. And this led a whole range of watches made from many, many different companies. Some of these you can pick up for almost nothing on eBay today. Some of them, like these HPs and gold, sell for pretty serious money. This was one avenue that the Quartz uh, revolution kicked off. And the other avenue was of design. And of course, I'm highlighting that with Swatch and their amazing Keith Haring selection. These Keith Haring watches bring as much as some precious mechanical watches do today. So I point, I point this out because this is a split in the evolution. Quartz results in boom, either techie or boom, either design oriented. We're starting to see these fuse back a little bit with the Apple Watch today, but it's taken quite a bit of time. Now, while we speak of the quartz crisis in the 70s and 80s through the lens of the mayhem it caused, we don't speak enough about how it liberated the watch market and how responsible it is for the creative renaissance that we're currently witnessing. With the advent of quartz technology and wristwatches, the pursuit of accuracy and mechanical timekeeping was put in its place, right? You're never going to achieve the same standard on a mechanical watch as you can achieve in a quartz watch. Better technology emerged. It doesn't mean that we still don't pursue it, but it does mean that other doors are open once that door of finality is, is definitely, definitely closed. So coupled with advancements in computer technology and with the knowledge that quartz watches will always be more accurate than mechanical watches, the post quartz watch crisis or revolution led to an absolute reimagining in the mechanical watch industry as to what's possible in regards to dial design, what's possible in regards to case design and the engineering of mechanical movements. We start seeing CAD taking effect in the mid 1980s with watch design and everything changes. Now a close friend of mine, you're probably wondering what the hell this picture is, a close friend of mine from the fine art world, his name Andras Santo, he and I often have this discussion where we compare what happened in the watch world to what happened in the fine art world over a century and a half prior. If you think about art, most of art up through the mid-19th century is orientated around realism. It's always about capturing the subject as accurately as possible, painting the subject as accurately as one could. Then, mid-19th century, cameras start to proliferate. Now, all of a sudden, a new technology can accomplish accuracy and realism in a way that the artist never could. What's the direct spin-off of this. What happens in France after the proliferation of photography? Boom. We see the rise of the Impressionist painting. We see the rise of all the alternative artistic movements. This can only happen on the timeline after photography is invented. This is what I argue is happening today in watches. Since we have solved accuracy in a way that a mechanical watch never can, we're living right now in this period of liberation. We're living in this point where watchmakers and designers and brands, really independents having even more flexibility, don't have to worry about shackles on them anymore. They're not going to achieve that degree of accuracy, so now they can think outside the box. So let's dissect this journey a little bit. Coming out of the quartz crisis, in addition to producing quartz watches, the traditional companies who had survived, their instinct was to keep things classical, keep things traditional, but modernize it up to a point. So Audemars Piguet creates an ultra-thin perpetual calendar watch. This was designed not by Genta, but by his successor, Jacqueline Dimier. 
And the idea was, well, these quartz watches are really thin, so if we're gonna be in the business, if we're gonna appeal to people, we gotta make a thin mechanical watch. And it was a huge success for the company. If you hear the story that the Royal Oak saved AP from the quartz crisis, that's really only part one. It was really this watch right here that saved us, and we made a lot of them. If you don't believe me, hop onto eBay. They're available. We made a lot of these watches. And the other company who was really pushing the envelope uh, continuously was Patek Philippe. They also did not abandon the classical complications at any point, but they were reimagining them for a new audience. So the advent of computers allowed them to create the 3974, which for the first time in a wristwatch produced, combined perpetual calendar with minute repeater. That was achieved in 1989. So this watch, 1978, this one, 1989. Now, as we head into the 1990s, we start to see this liberation really start to take hold. As watchmakers and more importantly, consumers start to digest more and more avant-garde watches, the level of experimentation continues. So here, of course, we have the IWC Il Destriero, Grand Complicated Wristwatch. We have the Patek 5016, which incorporated Turbion into the watch. The Audemars Piguet Minute Repeater with Star Wheel the Longue Pour Le Marite with Chain Fusé Tourbillon, and the Trilogy of Time by Ulysses Narden. These are all watches that would have been unthinkable before the quartz crisis. They would not have even been imagined. Even though all of these complications had appeared on pocket watches prior, none of these configurations and none of these aesthetics would have possibly made their way onto a watch had the quartz crisis not happened. At least this is my argument, this is my thesis. And then as we continue on the timeline and we get even into the more contemporary sphere, we see a further and further deconstruction as to what's taking place in contemporary watches. Most of these are post 2000 and these are all primarily either from independent brands or independent makers producing for a brand. This of course is the first Audemars Piguet concept, the CW1, which was produced in 2002. We have an early Richard Meal. We have the Poetic Wish from VCA, which was created by Jean-Marc Wideract. So here we're looking, of course, at Giulio Papi. We're looking over here at Jean-Marc Wideract. We're looking here at Max Bucer's new perpetual calendar watch, absolutely stunning timepiece. And then uh, the Grubel Forsey that was made in conjunction with Mr. Dufour over here. So we have a real fantastic assembly of really what's continuing now. As we're getting further and further along into this era, we're seeing what's possible. But as we're seeing this innovation and this expressionism, we're also seeing the pendulum go the other direction as well. And this, of course, is the Philippe Dufour simplicity. And of those of you who follow auctions know that three of these time-only watches recently achieved a quarter million dollars each at auction for a time-only watch. The demand was absolutely essential, absolutely huge. This is the fascinating era that we're in right now with watches. Anything goes. You want to collect 200-year-old pocket watch, you're going to bid up to $3 million to get it, but you can do it. You want to buy the $11 million Patek, the $1 million AP, those pieces are out there. But so in the contemporary sphere, you have highly postmodern, deconstructed, very, very unusual, very, very creative watches made alongside some very, very simple and traditional classic timepieces as you see here. So this massive spirit of liberation and innovation, as I said, it goes into greater and greater levels as we move further and further down the timeline. Dufour, Giulio Papi, Grubel Forsey, Max Bucer, Widerecht, so many others are able to create with incredibly wide latitude and able to take risks. They, just like their predecessors, are blurring this line between form, between function, between design, art, technology, and horology. In many ways, we've really come full circle back to the Renaissance. Here we are amidst superior technology, yet still producing beautifully finished, highly detailed, and exceptionally well-designed creative mechanical watches. If we take a step back, away from the broader industry talk of profits and loss, away from marketing campaigns, away from award ceremonies, away from comparisons over who's better, who has more long-term value, if you just look at the watches being made today, 
by the, and the men, women and men who are creating them, if you visit the manufacturers, if you spend time with these watchmakers, it's simply astonishing. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We are in a golden age of watchmaking. I think that organizations like the HSNY are even starting to reflect this. More and more are wanting to get together and share these passions and share these stories. We're in the first 15 years. All those names I mentioned a moment ago, that was unthinkable 20 years ago. We used to talk about brands, not individual makers. Now it's not enough when people come to Audemars Piguet. They want to see Francisco in the restoration workshop. They want to have a meeting with Julio. It's not just about the brand. It's the men and women creating the pieces as well. This is incredibly important components, bringing the humanity back into this business. Now, I'm often asked by collectors, enthusiasts, friends, and press, what's the future of mechanical timekeeping? How much longer will this technology remain relevant? Why is mechanical timekeeping still popular today in the digital age? We've been through the age of discovery, the industrial revolution, machine age, and onto the present day, yet we still keep evolving mechanical watches. We still create new mechanisms, new movements, improving repeaters, improving chronographs, new materials, new cases. Why? Why do people like us gather here to study, interpret, and share aspects of mechanical horology with such focus and dedication? You guys all came out on a Monday night to hear me speak. It's crazy. I've spent 20 years now investigating these lines of inquiry, and hopefully this evening's talk starts to shed some light on these questions, or at least starts to get you to think on a new level. The intertwining roots that horology shares with artisanship and technology is definitely central to its wide and diverse appeal. First and foremost, regardless of what system of time measurement one uses, from the sundial to the atomic clock and every mechanical object in between, we're always linked to astronomy in our cozy little corner of the solar system. Our whole concept of time derives from greater astronomical realities, and this will always remain the anchor. Time is astronomy, number one. Second, the threads of horological history from the most ancient systems that we started with to the most current mechanical marvels that we finished with are vibrant and strong. We measure elapsed time, we announce the time through bells and gongs, we have visual displays of calendars and phases of the moon, and of course this constant balance and dance between tech and artistry. Bear in mind that most watch wearers look at their timepiece 40, 50, 60, 70 times a day, but we only register the time half the amount. What are we doing the other half? We're looking at the functional art and the sculpture that resides on our wrists. The movement's a reflection of engineering and horological science. The case is a reflection of form language, sculpture, architecture. The dial's a reflection of design language like a photograph or a painting. It's a work framed by a bezel. Those enthusiasts know what I'm talking about. When you spend time, minutes, and hours under the loop looking at these mechanisms, it becomes greater than the sum of its parts. The next reasons may be a little esoteric and theoretical, but it's one I'm convinced of. Here in the digital age, we're in a world of constant and persistent connectivity. We cannot escape it. Even our appliances are connected to the net. But mechanical watches and clocks have become a sanctuary of independence from this reality. It's a self-contained system with this one-to-one -one relationship with the person wearing it. It's only you, the maker, and the watch. That's it. Unlike our phones, our smart devices, our tablets, it's not connected to anything. This one-to-one -one relationship is becoming an incredibly rare commodity in this information era and is undoubtedly a major factor for the widespread popularity of what's essentially obsolete technology in purely practical terms. There's permanence about horological objects, objects as their true expressions of interdisciplinary art and sciences and their true symbols as well. They represent our own passage of time. They're also windows into the era and culture of those that produce them. The entire history of science and technology has always been anchored to the time code and will continue to be so. Intertwined roots and intertwined future. Thank you. I know we covered a lot of uh, ground there. Very nice, Michael. Uh, if anybody has any questions, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. On the pocket watch, the automaton, mm -hmm. the barking dog. Yeah. You said there were bellows in there. Yeah. Where were the bellows located? By the um, it's just like a mainspring? Sing Correct. Or? It's just like a singing bird box. The bellows are contained inside a little small brass container. And it's ju literally just like, a sing it's just like a singing bird box. Let me just go back to yeah, it. Yeah. I'm just trying to. I wanted to ask you that before. There it is. Yes. Okay, so the main 
So you have two springs over here, so I think the bellows underneath. You're talking about that little box that's there? Yep. Okay, and the gongs all around. How many Correct. Gongs? What's that, one or two gongs? It's, it's two gongs. Well, it it's might be one gong. No, I think it's... I can't tell. I'd have to open up this particular piece. It should be two gongs, though. Okay. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Questions? I don't know if you covered um, pocket sundials mm. um, and like the, the, there was something I researched a while ago about they use water, I think in China, ancient China, like they use like water mm -hmm. dropping in a bucket. Yeah, um, we, uh, yeah. Yeah, we had, we, we, we did that right in the beginning. That's a great, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You missed I'm, your one opportunity to hear somebody lecture on water clocks. It's, it doesn't come around often. It's, like, <laughs> um, it's all right. Um, and the other thing is, what was it about quartz that just destroyed the mechanical? Um, can you go more into sure, quartz? Sure, absolutely. Right. It was essentially, it's far superior technology at a fraction of the price. So it doesn't cost any, I mean, initially it was a little expensive from 69 to 73, it was still a little pricey, but by the mid seventies, it gets very, very cheap, very inexpensive. And now you can start wearing watches in any context because you don't have to remove your fragile mechanical watch and put it to the side. You can now go swimming, you can play baseball, you can do whatever you want with this timepiece, with this watch. You don't have to service it as much, you just have to change the battery. And it also felt new. I mean, for those of us who remember this time period, this was, you have to remember that quartz watches are also tied to the dawn of microelectronics. This is part of the history of computers as well. I, I can go on too many tangents, so I try to keep it under control, but pretty much all of these little panels can develop into its own talk. But the quartz watch, it's its, its own parallel technology, much like what's happening with smart watches today. I remind people that it's, it's a smart watch is a computer that resides on your wrist. If, if a smart watch is a wrist watch, then my phone is a pocket watch. It's, it's a matter of how you frame and how you look at these things and recognizing what's transitional technology and what's permanent technology. What they didn't anticipate with quartz watches was that it would, that luxury itself would take a beating. Um, the industry, before the quartz watches, if you look at wristwatches from the 50s and 60s, it really starts to become a lot like jewelry for a lot of the companies. Um, the companies all started to introduce model numbers and reference numbers. They were increasing production. They were getting more serious about their business and their profits, and their profits started to get very, very large. They used, used to be small family-run businesses, and they were now turning into these pretty grandiose luxury firms, and some of them grew vastly. Um, interestingly, the ones who didn't grow as fast, the ones who didn't grow as much, the smaller Swiss family-run businesses are the ones that did pretty well during this time and actually were able to grow during this time. But to answer your question, cheaper, more affordable, more easy to use, it just wiped it out and it killed a whole group of clientele. But as I said, it was the benefit was what ultimately what came several years later, the awakening that took place, which this industry really needed that to happen. Uh, from 1960 to about 1980, you also had the Acatron watch. Yeah, you, we sure did. And even before, that's right, we, even the electromechanical Hamilton masterpieces. I wanted to do a whole thread on the transitional technology, and I have those slides, but it was hard to keep it in check. And you're absolutely right. Um, Jenem's referring to amazing technology by Bulova called the Accutron, which was incredibly accurate technology that uh, was still primarily mechanical, technology, but did start to incorporate some next-gen principles and ideas. Also, the Hamilton electromechanical watches as well. Um, these are very, very interesting and sophisticated pieces. Great to collect if you know somebody who can repair them. That's sometimes the challenge with this transitional technology. What Charlie says. And even those new... Oh, sorry. Sometimes you can buy brand new old stock components for Accutrons. But many times that when you use the component, the component is deteriorated and will not function properly. So that's become a big problem because I'm not sure exactly why, but maybe the materials were not stable enough at the time. Right. So first of all, thank you so much for your talk. This was very interesting. Um, I particularly enjoyed your um, reframing of the quartz crisis as a quartz revolution uh, and your analogy between 
the development of quartz technology with the development of the camera and its effect on uh, impressionist painting, the development of impressionism as a result. Um, some of the examples that you showed with regard to the modern era watches that you said uh, were only possible because of this kind of liberation from mm -hmm. the focus on accuracy in timekeeping uh, do include uh, complications that were seen in earlier timepieces that were very much focused on accuracy. You've got the tourbillon there. Um, even you could argue that the perpetual calendar is a kind of complication that's focused on accurate timekeeping without the need to reset the watch. Um, but I'm curious how you see those kinds of modern complications being embedded in timepieces as fitting within your thesis that uh, it's only possible because of the quartz crisis. That's a great question. One, one thing I would say with regard to the tourbillon is I could see how that would be something that's inherently a useless complication in a, a wristwatch, and so that could be one uh, kind of one out. But I'm curious what your other thoughts are. Definitely. Well, we'll start with the tourbillon. The the first tourbillon made in series to showcase the carriage on the dial was the was the Piguet 1986 tourbillon, and um, others had existed before, but these were made in a few hundred examples. And that was also our first watch made using CNC machine. It was also the first time titanium was used in an escapement. It was the thinnest. It was the first automatic tourbillon. Literally, the watch was designed on a computer. So to create that watch in its inception, even though it's ultimately hand-finished, the computer still had to do the math, a lot of the math. And when you visit the best watchmakers today, the computers are running. The computers are working. When you sit down with Giulio, and by the way, Giulio Papi was one of the main designers of the Port Limerite. He was with AP at the time, uh, APRP, and ended up with Lange. This is another example of that watch. This is something that he's described as a mechanism that he had thought of before, but he needed these new tools and these new technologies to ultimately be able to achieve the piece, to be able to trial and error the math and the geometry over and over and over again without having to create the components over and over and over again. So I think in that regard, you're right that there were definitely small numbers of watches made with some of these complications. So the complications is one side of it. Um, well, let's see, really none of these actually, um, you never had a watch this complicated before the advent of computers, a wristwatch. You never had a tourbillon repeater perpetual never had um, an 11 line star wheel repeater. All of these really were assisted with newer technologies, even though they're all traditionally made Swiss watches. Um, the complications, the roots of them were all there. These certainly not. These are definitely uh, much more experimental, the Ulysses Narden trilogy of time, these astronomical watches. These were pretty much, pretty out there for the time period. But in addition to the mechanism, it's also the dials and the cases which we're also looking at and considering as well. I don't know if I exactly answered your question or not, but I would argue that these hypothetically could have been made by an individual maker, but not made in duplicates by a company before the advent of the more contemporary technology, which quartz is part of, right? Even though these aren't quartz watches, they're part of, they're, they're made with the assistance of computers, which is very much part of that history of microelectronics, which quartz is connected to. That's what I view as part of the revolution. What did this, what did this new technology enable us with? We know what it took away. We know it created more effective movements, but what did these, what are the parallel technologies in this zeitgeist, in this time period? Because think about 1969 to 1985, the quartz crisis, this is also the, when computers grow up. Right, we're, we're, this is when computers go from the size of, of this wall behind me to, uh, to an object that can sit on your desk. Um, so it's, it's, it's that particular period which permits this to follow. That's what I was arguing. The other thing is also size. A lot of people wonder about size of watches. And I'm one of those people who actually says the influence of large watches is really rooted in here. You know, Audemars Piguet, of course, oversized the Royal Oak, and the Nautilus was big, and the Offshore was big in 93, but my generation grew up with massive calculator watches and video game watches, the big Nintendo watches. Seriously, like, you grow up with that stuff, by the time you're 20, 25, 30, the 34 millimeter watch feels really small on your wrist. You, we almost got accustomed to larger format watches from a lot of those tech pieces. So the same thing with cell phones, right? Yeah, for sure.
On a related note, with regards to accuracies, are there any efforts in the mechanical movements to bring them closer to uh, courts? You know, one of the one of the hundred reasons why I love Nick standing over here is this is one of the first conversations we had, and we were having lunch, um, we were eating Japanese food, I think, and I I made that comment to you about how how much more accurate courts is, and you said to me, well, Michael, that just means there's that much more we can do on the mechanical side to get every step closer, and that really stuck with me, and absolutely, and and. Pursuits of mechanical horology are so alive. I don't mean to suggest whatsoever that this is quieted down. W if anything, we're able to think about it through new ways and through new passages. A good example, and again, I'm, I'm referencing AP. I'm the historian for them, and I hear the stories from the watchmakers. But a good example is the AP escapement, which, which uh, has its roots going all the way back to 1790. It was a clock escapement made by Robin. And Robin created this incredibly accurate escapement so accurate, but it had no shock resistance at all. And you don't make a watch in the late 1700s without shock resistance because how do we travel? How do we move around? You need to have that some degree of shock resistance. He abandons the escapement. Clocks, no problem. Watch is a problem. And uh, Breguet even experiments with the Robin escapement. He's documented these. One of them exists. One of them sold. Flash forward a couple hundred years, literally, and, and Julio rediscovers the Robin escapement, and again, with the aid of computers, is able to get the math, get the geometry right, um, able to solve the shock resistance and, and introduces the AP escapement. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. And um, we just also released a double balance wheel, which is an improvement over standard escapement. Um, I, all the brands are pushing the envelope with this. Increased frequencies, increased reliability. I think another version of this maybe is not accuracy, but is reliability. Rolex is now famous 10-year warranty. All the brands have their different strengths, and they're playing to those strengths to appeal to that question, what more can we do? Can it be more accurate? Can it be more reliable? Can it be more trustworthy? All these different questions are definitely, definitely being asked. And part of it's for the functional purposes as well. The brands, of course, uh, they want the watches to come back for the necessary routine servicing, but not more than they should be coming back because that could create a bottleneck, which all the watchmakers in this room know, uh, no matter what brand you're talking about, sometimes when new product comes out, the bottleneck gets created before all the kinks are worked out. Charlie made the point better than I did, going back to both your questions. That's exactly right. CAD, makes, CAD does the trial and error for you. Yeah. You, CAD is the model. Yeah. So you can make thousands of watch models and find the appropriate piece or part to tweak it so it's perfect. Correct. That's a good question. Nicholas, do you have an answer to that? I'd say the industry is, is pretty much split between Autodesk Inventor and uh, SolidWorks. It's pretty even split. It just depends on where you work. Which, which, which data uh, Autodesk, Autodesk Inventor, and SolidWorks. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Michael? Um, thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I, I want to try a more of a marketing approach and, sure. and, and a cynical question. Please. Um, and you, you mentioned way back when, when, when women would wear you sh the Rembrandt painting where the woman was showing off the watch, not the fan. Um, I once met a gentleman who was writing a book about high-end watch, not just high-end watches, but the people who collect them. And he said, you know, at least 90% of the people who bought these fabulous watches bought them purely for the way they look for the aesthetic. Yes. Um, why does somebody buy a 3974? Is it, you know, if you took 10 people who bought 3974s, is it because it's expensive? Is it because of the way it looks? Um, and, and how many of them really are impressed by the 700 components inside that watch? Are we, are we really unusual, the, the group of us here? Are we? I think that's rhetorical. <laughs> no, listen, okay, first part of your question, yes. Watches were very much worn 
primarily as fashion. Um, there are some incredible clippings when you look through old uh, late 18th and early 19th century French journals. And I was, I was humored by the increase of people wearing watches on two wrists. So I wanted to research this. Has this ever been done before in history? And I, Jonathan knows where I'm going with this. Um, there, we have documentation of women in France, really particularly between like 1790 and 1805, were double rocking chatelains, one on each side of their waist. And we know this from illustrations. So it's, uh, it's not just the Red Bar crew who's been double wristing. It was the, uh, it started back in France uh, in the 1790s, to your point, to demonstrate the, the, a little bit of opulence, style, fashion, all of those things. I think, and what I was touching upon in the talk, I think the buyer of the 3974 or the 2499, or or the new or the new uh, complication from any of these makers. I really do think it is that combination on some level. I think of form and function. Now, where that emphasis is is going to depend depend on the on that particular individual. First of all, if you're if you're an individual of means, you ultimately end up with limited objects to spend your money on, and. Also, when you're somebody of means, you find you, these people often spend money on things that really don't have much inherent value, don't have much perceived value after a certain amount of time, right? Things get old pretty quickly. Your boat's great when your boat's new. Your plane is great when your plane is new, but these things become a money pit and they become old. Even an art and car collection has a certain degree of management required for it. You know, you hear car guys say this all the time, well, I'd buy more cars, but I just need more space. Um, even paintings collectors say, well, I'd like to buy more, but I don't like to buy something if I'm not looking at it. Watches creates a very different reality for the collector mentality. You could have 60 watches and two briefcases, and you could look at them very easily all at once. It's very, very special in that regard. And watch collecting is one of the categories, no matter what you have in your pocket, hundred dollars, a thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million, there's awesome options to collect. And you grow up with it. Some of the most established, famous collectors, he, I'll mention one by name because he's publicly done his Hodinkee, but even somebody like Jason Singer I've known for a long time. You watch Jason's footage, he's an amazing collector of great, great watches, but he started out when he was in medical school flipping Rolexes and buying bubble backs and things like this at a low cost. When I was a student, I was collecting Omega Dynamics. I still have 15, 20 of these things, all different dial colors. You mentioned Accutrons. I have so many of those Accutrons sitting around. Some of them still work. I can't get rid of these pieces. I love them in that regard. So I'm one of those people where if, if, if I did end up winning a lottery or something along those lines, I'd be right in there buying that AP and that Patek uh, and, that, and those minute repeaters and some of these independent brands without a doubt. Um, so I think for many of the people, the reason why they choose something like a 3974 is they recognize that it was an incredible complication when it came out. It was immensely sophisticated. And it also cuts through the timeline a little bit. I think there's, a, there's people who look for objects that can kind of slice through the timeline a little bit, that can feels both classic and contemporary, that is gonna remain relevant in the future. Um, it's a very different mindset than a Daytona collector. And not that you don't have a collector who buys both. We certainly know of individuals who buy both. But when you buy a Daytona, you know you're buying really a, an object of design and fashion and aesthetics. We all know the Valjeu 72, awesome caliber, great workhorse, but you can find those same movements in watches at a mere fraction of the price. So why are we spending 300, 400, 500 on a chronograph that was essentially mass produced? It, we, all, we, we know why, condition, rarity, specific variations, all of that stuff. But that's a, very, that, that, that's a very much a heart purchase. That's like a true art market in some regards. There really is no inherent value in terms of the mechanism. The collector who goes towards the more cl classical or traditional Patek, they see the inherent value. They rec even if they don't fully understand it, they recognize it through the marketing, but also through the watch itself, through the finishing. You don't have to be an expert to look at a mechanism or look at a dial and recognize hand finishing versus machine finishing. Um, and this is really an entry point that people really get into watches. Why do people spend a quarter million on a time-only Philippe Dufour? Why? I mean, he's the great, one of the greatest living watchmakers, if not the greatest, but it's that it's more than a watch. It's art at that point. It really is. It's the work of an artisan. It's the work of a master, one of very, very, very few pieces produced. So if you ask me what are the greatest watches of the 20th century, 
from a pure objective standpoint, the 3974 hits that, hits that list of 10 without a doubt because it was you know, what it achieved at that point in time, all before 1990. Michael. Yes. Uh, I wasn't alive in the 70s, thank God, but it sounds <laughs> like a terrible time. I'm, I'm curious how you compare that to today. I mean, we're hearing that it's a, you know, you say it's the golden age of, of watchmaking. Yeah. Meanwhile, exports are down tremendously. Vintage is soaring but modern sucks. I guess the question is why, what's going on? Is this the internet effect? Is it people saying, yes, yeah, smartwatches won't affect it, but it's affecting the bottom of the market, but then you get so much transparency on pricing through the internet. Meanwhile, you have so much access to vintage through the, through the internet, like what's going on? Okay, great, fantastic question. And HSNY is one of the few organizations where I can actually answer this. It's a nonprofit. I don't have to be political in this answer. And it's a challenging question and a very good one. Number one, let's, let's handle vintage first. First of all, on vintage, it's, it's not one theme of everything going up consistently. There are many vintage watches that are at 20 year lows right now by significant major brands, okay? All of us, AP, Patek, Vacheron, you name it, I can tell you numerous models that are way down in value right now. Every single rectangular vintage watch is down. Watches that, Watches that were bringing 80 to 120,000 at auction in 2000 are estimated at 30 to 50 today. There's many, many models that fall into this category. Same thing with smaller watches. Really small diminutive pieces are just dead on the market. We see this over and over and over again. Um, a Patek reference 2524, their minute repeater, amazing watch. It's selling generally at the same or 20 less than what it was 15 years ago. Meanwhile, the 2499, a beautiful big 36 millimeter watch, which meets today's collecting trends, is selling at a massive premium. Um, so all of the brands have watches that are up and watches that are down. Um, Rolex, we were talking about the Daytonas, they're all up so, so high for the most part, but imagine the guys who are collecting bubble backs and Rolex princes. Uh, Jonathan and I know a lot of those guys. These, their, their collections aren't worth much anymore. And some of those princes were bringing tens of thousands of dollars 20 years ago. Some of those bubble backs were bringing tens of thousands of dollars 20 years ago, and they're not worth anything now. So that's first. We have to keep in mind that some vintage watches are up. They have to, be, they have to meet today's collecting criteria, and they have to be in damn good condition. You know, they have to have everything going for them. Um, there was, there, you know, it does it, one dial reprint, replaced hands, replaced bezel, replaced bridge, anything along those lines, the value will go down, down, down further. Um, we just saw Royal Oak sell for 56,000 at auction. The bracelet was replaced, but the, it was a number 40. The head and the dial was so good, it went for a great price. Just the previous auction from the same house in Geneva, another low number, but with a replaced movement, replaced by the factory, but the case and dial were great, very little interest, and it did 32,000. It's a pretty significant difference, but for good reason, always for good reason. Now on the modern side, this gets a little trickier and a little more political, but we have to keep in mind that watches, the watch industry started to go public 25 years ago, and it changed everything. And those of you who've heard me speak before, at least in smaller circles, know I talk about this a lot. I have to be careful because I have such respect for other brands and love for other brands. But I can say that I argue that this industry should not have gone public. The reason is, is the whole history of watchmaking was anchored on stability. The relationship was between the maker and the consumer. When you go public in an industry that's about craft and about artisanship and about R&D and about taking time to create, you end up with a little bit of a juxtaposition. What matters most, the next quarterly stock price or the consumer experience? I'm not saying for every brand it's the next quarterly stock price, but if you're public, it is definitely a concern. So conventionally, how do you grow a publicly traded firm? You grow a publicly traded firm by, incre by increasing product and making more product. What do you do when that product cannot be accommodated on the market? Well, you clean the market, you discount, you discontinue, you feed the gray. You end up with this cycle that takes place which challenges people's comfort levels with a particular brand at times or their confidence or their willingness to pay full for something that they feel maybe they can get at a different price later. It's one thing when you go and buy your jacket 
at 800 bucks and you see it at 500, you're like, damn, man, 300 bucks I could have saved. It's another thing when you buy a watch at 30,000 and you see it for 16,000, that's gonna kill a watch collector. That's gonna turn somebody towards vintage is what that's gonna do or get them out of the game altogether or just make them very cautious from that point forward. This is why on the contemporary side, you're seeing massive sellout on certain product from certain brands. I mean, we cannot keep our 39 millimeter Royal Oaks in because people know the production is small on the 15202 and they snatch them up. They know it's a safe buy. They, they have a good sense, they have that good feeling about it. Similar with the Nautiluses, similar with certain of the Tudors that are released in numbers, similar with certain of the Rolexes. There are certain pockets of activity where you see lots of buoyancy because the demand remains greater than the supply. But this is the rarity. Most often, the supply is greater than the demand because you have publicly traded companies operating these brands, looking for profits and looking for growth. There's many benefits that come from this. More R&D money, uh, new calibers come to market faster, um, a hiring of, of maker, watchmakers and craftsmen and women when the markets are doing good, but when things turn, it can get a little dark and it can get a little heavy as what we're witnessing now. Interestingly, you cited the numbers and um, you know when you look across the market right now, the brand, not every brand is doing poorly. I mean, we're, the brands are doing well are trying to be cool about it because you know it's not, knock wood, it continues, but also, you know, it's a small, close-knit industry. But Rolex is faring very well. They're an independent company. AP, we're having a great year this year, and we had a great one last year. Patek is strong. On the independent side, Richard Meal is strong. All four companies I just mentioned, guess what? They're all independent. None of them are beholden. It doesn't mean that that's why they're doing well. What it does mean is that they can move with a different level of efficiency than the public brands can't. If in, in, in our world, if we see a product starting to take off in a certain region, we'll reallocate the next batch of inventory and go heavier towards that region. We're fluid. We can, we can bob and weave, Muhammad Ali style. If you're one of the big brands producing tens of thousands, it doesn't really, you don't always have that flexibility. Um, and so certain pieces end up sitting around and then end up, uh, the value can, could potentially end up diminishing. If, if you'll permit me, I'll take the last question for tonight, and Michael, please forgive me for this. Earlier uh, in your presentation, you talked about the incense clocks. Yes. Right? And we know that AP makes some of the best minute repeaters in the world. <laughs> Is there any chance that we're going to see an <laughs> incense complication from AP in the future? That's a wonderful question. You know, I, I think that I think that's something that is worth bringing up with the big boss. I, I think, I so think too. he would. I think he'd like I that think idea so too. He'd have a couple jokes to make. I'm sure. Let's give Michael another hand. Thank you all.